The aftermath of the KPG extinction event, which saw all of the non-avian dinosaurs go extinct, as well as a large swath of other animals at the end of the Mesozoic, left open a great amount of niches in its aftermath. Said niches, particularly those of large herbivores, were swiftly filled by many taxa, many of them being mammals, which were now unburdened by the lack of the presence of the non-avian dinosaurs, with one of these key, early mammal groups being the Dinoceratons, or the Uintertheus. Evolving and diversifying soon after the Mesozoic in the late Paleocene, around 56 million years ago, just around 10 million years after the last non-avian dinosaurs went extinct, they lasted up until the late Eocene and came in some pretty interesting forms with some intriguing appearances. Dinoceratons are generally divided into two families, being the Prodinoceratidae, containing the most basal genus of Prodinoceras and sometimes the genus of Probathiopsis, as well as the Uintotheridae, which contains all of the other genera, including the namesake Uintotherium. The Uintotherid genus, Gobiotherium, is also often placed into its own separate subfamily of Gobiotherinae, due to their distinctiveness as will be discussed, though this is contentious. To start, Prodinoceras, the most basal of the Uintotheres, lived in the late Paleocene of Mongolia, being a relatively small animal compared to its relatives at about 2.9 metres in length. They are considered as the most basal member of the group, as well they did have the characteristic fang-like tusk-like teeth which is a key signifier of their classification, they did lack the horn-like ossicones present on their relatives' heads. These early Uintotheres lived in subtropical conditions, quite the opposite to how Mongolia is today, and were likely to have been generic browsers. Probathiopsis was a genus that lived around the same time as Prodinoceras, but instead lived in North America, which indicates that the group occurred simultaneously in both North America and in Asia which meant that the two landmasses were connected to an extent during this time, and that there was indeed an interchange between the two species of Dinoceratons and other animal groups. Later animals like Bathyopsis, which lived from the early through to the middle Eocene, were generally similar in appearance to these two early genera, but now featured the derived traits of two small knobs on the head, which down the line in later Uintotheres would become even more extravagant. To gain some more background into these next few animals, it's worth first trying to go over their initial discoveries and descriptions, since it was a very tumultuous, but also very enlightening process as to how wild the field of paleontology and scientists can get in classifying animals. The fossils of some large mammals were found in both Wyoming and in Utah near the Uinta Mountains, which would later give the mammals their name, in and around the Bridger Basin in 1870. This was around the time when the so-called Bone Wars, a series of disputes mainly by the paleontologists Othniel Marsh and Edward Cope, was ongoing, with the two seeking to both undermine each other and to describe as many new taxa as they could to prove their own supremacy. Also involved in these disputes, especially this one with these mammal bones, was Joseph Lydie, another paleontologist and also anatomist who would largely stay clear of the two bickerers for a good while, until the points where these mammal bones were being examined. The initial starting point of the Bone Wars remains unknown, though publication records show that the soon-to-be-discussed description of these new unusual prehistoric mammal bones would set the stage for their first major scientific showdown. Lydie, being more level-headed than the other two scientists, realised that in their fighting, their descriptions would be exceptionally convoluted and lead to much irritation to sort out down the rows, and so, to continue his mark on the field, sought to move quickly to establish his own names and classifications of the bones, before Martian Cope could come into the picture. So before he had even got home from a fossil collecting trip in the area, Lydie wrote a quick description of two fossil mammals his team had found. Going off of limb bones and a skull, Lydie named the first as Uintotherium robustum and the second as Uinta Masterix taro, which he didn't realise was actually the same animal, as he was going off of a tooth that was later found to be associated with the former Uintotherium. Lydie felt scientifically threatened, as he had become at the time the de facto authority of many of America's fossil mammals whereas Cope and Marsh were mainly dealing with reptiles, birds and fish. This meant that either intentionally or not, they had all generally avoided each other until this moment, though with the amazing remains that were being discovered, describing the animals became a paramount task for all three of them. Around the same time that Lydie had described these two animals, Cope utilised the telegraph alongside Marsh to quickly send word back to the American Philosophical Society notifying them of their findings. Many of these were often garbled, given how rushed they were, Though 18 days after the description of Uintotherium, both Cope and Marsh named new genera, being Loxolophodon and Eubacillus for Cope, and Marsh describing Tynocerus. Several days after this, Marsh erected the new genus of Dinocerus, with both them and Tynocerus receiving many additional species by Marsh throughout the following decades between 1870 and 1880. 
It became quickly apparent though that all of these mammals differed little, if at all from each other, as was found, and that many of them needed to be lumped together. Many of Marsh's names were determined to be valid, at least at the time, with Cope's Loxolophodon being deemed invalid, which utterly humiliated the latter, who was powerless to stop the scientific processes. He retaliated by publishing a broad analytical study where he proposed his own plan of classification for the mammals, discarding Marsh's genera in favour of his own, though Marsh remained steadfast and continued to call them out. Altogether, the two classified 25 different species to outdo each other, with their publications being pretty sparse and pointing to the most minute of dynastic differences in order to support their ideas. Classification-wise, Cope considers Uintotherium and the other species as being relatives to the proboscideans, animals like elephants due to some similarities noted in their anatomy, mostly noting their similar, column-like limbs as well as their skulls. Said skulls were very thick, having a comparatively tiny cranial cavity which was mitigated by the possession of several crevices in the skull, which were connected to their sinuses, which is seen in elephants and thus in many other mammals. That, and they also had a slightly retracted nasal bone, which was interpreted at the time to support a small trunk. It's more so considered that along with other similar mammals, this enlarged nasal opening likely supported more muscular lips and prehensile upper lips than something constituting a developed trunk. The bony projections on the skulls, which will be discussed more in detail soon, were assumed by Cope to be anchoring points for large antler-like horns, which made for a very full-on and impressive, though inaccurate reconstruction. Over time, many more fossils of these mammals were found across America, making them among the best known and generally understood extinct mammals of the time, with many more partial skeletons and skulls being discovered and described, which meant that through an increased understanding of their individual variation when compared to living animals, more on their taxonomic situation could be understood. A major reassessment of dinosauratans came about in the 1960s by Walter Wheeler, who re-described and synonymised many of the Uintotherium fossils found by Cope, Lydie, Marsh all those years back. Almost none of the proposed American and also Chinese genera and species survived the lumping, with only Uintotherium and Eubacillus remaining today, the latter being a genus found to indeed be distinct described by Cope, and the genus name of Uintotherium coined by Lydie and the species name of Anceps by Marsh respectively, also carrying over meaning that all three men managed to have a lasting scientific legacy with the animals. A further taxon, Uintotherium inspiratus, was described from China in the early 80s, showing that like their other dinosauratan relatives, the genus was quite widespread. Guessing into the animals themselves, and moving from their fairly convoluted description, Uintotherium were quite large animals, having skulls of about 76 cm in length, and being about, or just over 1.5 metres tall at the shoulder weighing up to two tons, which is similar in size to modern rhinos. Going more into detail on their skulls, they are weirdly flat in most dimensions, with their foreheads having a concave dip, which ends up creating a very small brain case for their size, and, compared to living mammals, which is unseen in other mammals aside from the brontotheres, which would also appear around the same time Uintotherium was alive, which is unseen in other mammals aside from the brontotheres, which would also appear around the same time Uintotherium was alive. They also had six large, knob-like ossicones which grew up from their frontal region, the same kind of structures seen in giraffes, but being more numerous. Made up of ossified cartilage that is covered by skin and hair, and then fused to the skull, these, also like in giraffes, protruding about 5-30 to centimeters from the skull, very likely serve the function of both defense and in sexual display, more on the latter which will be discussed shortly along with another feature being their large canine teeth. Said structures were very large, and would have been very formidable defensive weapons which coupled with their lack of upper incisors, matches very closely to the condition seen in muntjac deer. Said canine teeth are often found in mammals which have territorial behaviours over material resources and territories, with forms of aggressive social behaviour being employed. Behaviour-wise, like in muntjacs, you and Tetherium likely used a mix of their canines and the numerous protruding ossicones to fight against rivals, in where they would exhibit pairing behaviours if we go off of similar living animals. The possession of inframandibular flanges and a flexible jaw joint also meant for great capacity to open their mouths and display. Supporting this notion is their varying size, as there seems to be some sexual dimorphism going on. The teeth are both longer and sharper in male individuals, which matches with mammals like walruses, which also undergo large battles in order to compete for mates. They may well have also used them to help pluck aquatic plants from the marshes that were prevalent in their habitats. This feeding style in these environments is supported by the fact that they had analogous stocky limb proportions, a barrel-shaped ribcage, and pelvic adaptations for hind gut fermentation seen in modern hippos, thus in their structurally very simple cheek teeth, which is associated with feeding on softer plants. 
Something akin to this is also seen in the Cyrenians, like dugongs and manatees, which do share similar digestive systems with reduced dependence on the dentition to do so, given the softer plant material they feed off of. The lack of lip reconstructions you may have noticed going over these animals isn't just a paleo meme or going off of a flawed understanding of mammal anatomy, as it's because Uintotherium, similar to living munjaks, lack the derived chin soft tissue of cats, which is how animals with exceptionally long canines like cloudy leopards and the extinct Homotherium are and were able to conceal them to such a degree. Smilodon is a different case and frankly deserves its own video to discuss as part of their anatomy. But, to keep it short, the length of the teeth alone means that given how cat facial anatomy functions, even with the most lenient of reconstructions, the teeth would still mostly be exposed by a very unusual and unrealistic reconstruction, though this is getting off topic from the main video. Back to the Uintotheres, Eubacillus, found to indeed be a distinct genus by Cope, was even larger than Uintotherium, having massive, blocky skulls of up to a metre long and standing up to 2.1 metres at the shoulder, weighing 2.5 tonnes plus. Being the largest Uintothea, they also had a very large pair of tusks and ossicones, and overall would surely have been a very impressive animal to see. On quite the different notes, the last Uintothea I'll be discussing is arguably the most intriguing of them all, being Gobiotherium. Coming from the Urdin Manha formation in Mongolia, living alongside other Eocene mammals like Sarcastodon and Andrusarchus, they were one of the last Uintotheas known from the fossil records and being among the most unusual of them all. Unlike many of their relatives, they lacked the knob-like horns and even their large canine teeth. What they did have though was a big snout, which was very circular, alongside especially large cheekbones. This notable lack of many of the otherwise defining Uintothea features has meant that the genus has been referred to its own subfamily of Gobiotherinae, though some other researchers sometimes prefer to rank them in their own family of Gobiotheridae. Their skulls were very long and have a highly arched nasal region, which to this day has an ambiguous function. This sniffer of an animal was noted by some researchers, Osborne and Granger back in 1932, that there were bony lumps or horns present on the nasal arch of one Gobiotherium specimen, suggesting a potential link to sexual differentiation. The structure has also been thought to have been similar to that of the Cygrantelope's nose from Ruthero and Scotch in 2002, which in these animals helps to warm inhaled air. However, the authors did in their own paper reasonably note that such a comparison would be an erroneous one as this adaptation would have had little to no advantage in the overall humid climates present in the Eocene, one where even Mongolia was quite lush. It's also worth noting that the large noses of the Cygrantelope are also correlated with a lack of bone rather than the gross enlargement of it. Other researchers have also noted the similarities to the unrelated and later appearing Pleistocene Zygomaturus, a diprotodontid from Australia, though this comparison does little in clearing things up. A sexual display or a some form of resonating chamber has also been considered, though little has been looked into regarding them, and a re-examination of the fossil material we have would go a long way in perhaps understanding them better. In terms of where they fit into the overall mammalian tree of life, like many similar early mammals, doing so is very challenging, with their affinities being extensively debated. They have occasionally been placed outside of the placental mammal group in the order Chimolesta, or more generally in the Laurasia theria, Mammals that originated in the northern supercontinent of Laurasia, and more recently in varying ungulate groups like the South American Zeungulata. They have even in some cases been grouped in with rabbits due to some dental similarities, though today the safest general case is to classify them as stem ungulates and then leaving it at that until more certain placements within or outside of them can be determined. These animals all went extinct eventually around 37 million years ago, which was likely down to climatic changes that were occurring. The end of the Eocene and into the Oligocene was a time of great faunal turnover, where, especially in the oceans and the increases seen in Antarctic sea ice, likely caused either by extensive volcanic activity or meteor impacts, the planet began to cool over a couple hundred thousand years. This cooling impacted the Uintothea's preferred marshy and lush tropical ecosystems, and with their increased fragmentation and lack of representation in the areas in where they lived, they unfortunately could not adapt. Because of their convoluted taxonomy, the animals unfortunately, by a major review of them way back in 1998, have had little in the way of paleobiological work done on them to figure out as to both what they were, and also more specifically as to how they lived. Given how impressive their skeletons are, and especially their skulls, this is a great shame as there is almost certainly more to be discovered about them. The only thing to do is to conduct more research on them, and that all depends on who wants to take up the challenge. All in all, I thank you for watching this video on these animals and that you may have learned something new. If you would like to see more from this channel, be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. And with that, I'll see you next time, whenever that may be.